first of all, uh, welcome Mike Clark to the Two Sides Insight interviews. You're very welcome. And it's a pleasure to be with you again after so many years. <laughs> no, well, it's a, by way of introduction, Mike uh, employed me, joined Finboard, and I think I've got my date right, but it was 1986, I believe. Um, your memory on that will be better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I joined as an internal sales executive working out of the London office. And uh, you gave me a lot of support and encouragement for which I'm uh, very grateful for. Uh, so Mike um, is ex-Unilever. Uh, he was 18 years at Unilever as a management trainee, various different positions. And he then... Um, uh, he's uh, worked in five different countries, my word. His final job at Unilever was that of sales and marketing director for Austin Packaging on Merseyside. And then after a period of um, uh, working for ABF, running their Wormsley Calm business, he joined Finboard as sales director and then went on to become managing director of their UK uh, operations. He spent 22 years in the Finnish board industry, working for various businesses that are now Metsa board, covering a range of senior management positions across their international operations based in the UK and in Helsinki. His final appointment as a senior advisor to sustainability and environmental affairs with a global mandate. He was appointed to the board of PESC, that's the Programme for the Endorsement of Forest Certification, largest certifier of sustainable forest management and was chairman until he retired in 2009. He's fellow of the Institute of Materials, uh, Minerals and Mining and a knight first class of the Order of the Lion of Finland. How about that? And in 2010 he was awarded the UK Paper Industry Gold Award. Now that is impressive by any standards so congratulations. Well, it's very kind of you to say so. But uh, so often with these things, it's um, I've never been particularly embarrassed about putting myself forward. And I think if if you're visible, people think, oh, we better do something about him. Yes. <laughs> Keeping quiet. That's right. Well, look, I've got a number of questions. I've got six questions for you. So my first one is, look, you've travelled extensively. I know particularly across Scandinavia. Of of your travels, where has been the most uh, uh, memorable business trip? We always used to enjoy, it's something that one doesn't, that nobody does these days, um, but we used to enjoy taking customers to Finland to see the mills. Mm. And what was enjoyable about that was in those days, it was a very relaxed sort of way that they were made to work quite hard in terms of travel and listening to um, listening to lectures and that sort of thing. But the, the, the main thing was that a lot of people in those days had this view of Finland as being a sort of almost a communist country. Mm -hmm. And I can remember a neighbour trying to convince me that Finland was a communist country. And I had to point out to him at that time, it was the only country in Europe which had never had a so even a socialist government. Their governments had always been uh, right wing persuasion. Um, and I think those visits were really good because you used to get a lot of bonding you you bonded with your uh, colleagues in the Finnish mills and you bonded with your customers. So I think probably the first one of those I made would have been my most memorable. And we would go around, what, four or five mills and each mill determined to prove that they were the best. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So th that I uh, my other very interesting one, I once gave a uh, intro. It was memorable in the sense that it was wacky sort of thing. I gave a talk at the. Uh, California um, Polytechnic University in uh, San Luis Obispo. Uh, and that was interesting because it was I was representing um, the sort of European forest certification um, movement, if you like, um, but on behalf of, um, of METSA. And that was interesting because we were talking to young American students training uh, about packaging. Okay. And this was a big university course totally relating to focused on packaging and that's something we don't have in this country uh, a university focused on a university course focused on packaging we have college courses and that sort of thing but not a full-scale university course 
Interesting. Oh, thank you for that. So uh, during your time working in the paper industry, what have been the main themes of change over the past 20 years or so? And given the current economic challenges, what's your advice to bill owners and converters? I think that when I look back over, I mean, it's a long time since I retired, so uh, my intimate in, in my intimate knowledge is sort of pretty weak now. But I have noticed a big downgrading of what I would call customer service. And I always remember going on a course uh, at Cranley and um, the guy was an American guy giving a course on customer service. And he said, what people have to understand is you're never going to have the best product. And if you do, it's only going to be for a short space of time until your competitors catch up with you. And therefore, if in the eyes of the customer, you're going to be discriminated by your customer service rather than your product hmm. and therefore focus on customer service. And I think that we're moving in the digital world to a bigger focus on technical issues and people talking about product quality. Product quality is vital. You can't survive without product quality. But if you don't have good customer service, if your customers can't rely on you, why are they going to buy from you? And I think that is when I look at look at the industry now, I detect uh, a, a, a a diminution of um, of customer service in favour of I've got the best product here it is you know mine's the best um, and if you're very lucky I'll let you have it. And probably not helped by the fact that most communication these days is over the wire. That's right. That digital and that sort of face to face uh, interaction is less today than it was of course. Um, long lunches and social aspects of doing business are are becoming increasingly rare, aren't they? I can remember um, a customer, he's retired now, uh, running a carton business in the UK. And one of our competitors moved their office, their customer service office from the UK to Holland. And he said, I quote him, well, I'm not gonna quote him actually verbatim because I better edit out the swear words. But he said, um, they, per they speak perfect English and they can't understand anything that I say to them. Wow. Because what he was meaning was when I say to them, my factory is just the other side of Leeds. All they could do was look at a map. They would have no knowledge of what that meant in terms of planning journey times or, or whatever. Yeah, of course. Interesting. So what single event uh, over the years are you most proud of uh, from a career perspective? Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it was working for my company, but it was in a government context. Um, PFC had an enormous problem uh, getting recognition. They had been um, usurped and not usurped, but their position had been taken by FSC, Forest Stewardship Council, which is a marvellous organisation, mm -hmm. but it's very much a top down organisation. Here we have a plan. Um, you do it. PFC was bottom up. It was started in the forests and it developed a process in an individual country. So PFC took far longer to endorse as a national standard, but it was a much more robust system in terms of grower commitment to it. The problem was that the UK government were refusing to endorse PFC as uh, a purchase standard for, um, for government contracts. And this was a a massive problem or an oncoming problem for PFC, not just on the paper side, but also, of course, for building work, which would be a massive um, government contract. And I was put in charge. I was put in charge of PFC in the UK with the responsibility to negotiate um, government uh, government recognition of PFC. And that was a massive battle. It was a battle for me convincing Germans and Americans and people that it mattered because the UK didn't matter to them. Uh, it mattered to Finland and Sweden and other countries who were bringing timber in. And that was a a big, big 
um, a big, big moment. And when we got the recognition, deservedly so, when we got the recognition, we were endorsed by UK government. I could almost feel the sighs of relief coming across the North Sea from Scandinavia. And my Finnish boss admitted to me his very interesting comment. And it comes back in a way to you are talking about face to face. He said, we know we knew what we had to do. But he said we couldn't as Finns, we couldn't do it. We needed an we needed an Englishman. We needed to find an Englishman who understood what we wanted, who could articulate it. Translate it. Yeah. Translate it. And I've always said my most of my career was spent translating not from Finnish into English, but from Finnish um, culture into English culture. Mm. You know, things like senses of humour and, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, actually, my, my next question is that, as you know, um, consumers, people, I think the word consumers, people across Europe believe 15, only 15% people across Europe think that paper comes from managed forests and that paper doesn't kill trees. So the balance, 85% or so, think that uh, paper, 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 paper packaging is damaging trees, causing deforestation. Now we know that forests are growing in Europe. Um, two sides state openly that it's uh, to the order of 1500 football pitches by area every single day. Why do you think there is that disconnect that the consumer believes that forests are shrinking? Yes, I mean, if you go to one of the few parts of the world you can go to, and that would be Scandinavia or maybe Canada, um, the very few places you can go in the world where the forestry industry is actually part of the of the culture, part of the, I forget how many people work in the UK forestry industry, but it's something like a decimal point of, you know, X 1% of the working population, it, very small. I don't know what it is, but very small. And therefore people have no understanding. Hmm. And they don't therefore understand the arguments and they see these things and they tend to write it off as sort of, oh, really? Um, and well, of course they would say that, wouldn't they type of thing. And it's only when you get to those relatively small parts of the world where forestry is an intrinsic part and has been for generations of their working life that they understand the issue. And I can remember um, talking with the, um, the, the ENGO movement. They came over visit to look at Finnish forests and they said, gosh, this is yeah, looking at a cutting site. This is amazing. It's you know they've left the seed trees. They've there's no oil drums or anything left. Um, what is in the contract that penalises them if they did leave oil drums? And the the Finn said, well, there's nothing in the contract at all. But you must have something in the contract. And he said, well, we don't put it in the contract. Why? Because they wouldn't leave oil drums there because this is their land. You know they're not they don't want to foul it up. If you're going into a commercial forest in uh, maybe the UK, we'll pick on the UK because it's convenient. Um, the people that are doing it are not from a forestry culture or background. And therefore, you have to say to them, you can't leave oil drums because they wouldn't in Finland. They wouldn't do it because it's in their back garden, so to speak. And I think those are some of the issues that we face. Um, just turn my phone off now. Um, those are some of the issues that we face that are almost impossible to communicate. Probably also added to that, um, we've been bombarded, haven't we, as consumers uh, over the last two decades that going digital, uh, going to uh, digital billing, uh, not having receipts, uh, uh, save paper, save trees, that kind of messaging has become endemic, hasn't it? That the consumer and believes that saving saving paper saves trees. I think it's worse than that, uh, in the sense that we've had this, and I look at it from the point of view of packaging. Um, you've had all these environmental debates going on, and people choose to make an argument in favour of plastic, maybe, um, and therefore they will argue on weight and the amount of carbon emissions related to uh, to transport and 
the corrugated box may suffer as a result of that against reusable plastic boxes and all that sort of thing. And therefore, the consumer gets all befuddled and exactly like they do when we have an early day motion in the House of Houses of Parliament, people don't understand what it's all about. So they just say, oh, forget it. You know, it's all just, you know. And I think we've done as an industry enormous damage to ourselves. I'm not talking about paper now, but the packaging industry. We've done enormous damage to ourselves by running several different arguments at the same time and picking on one issue now and another issue tomorrow. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. I know that you um, love the art. I'm changing gears a little bit here. I know that you <laughs> love the arts and, and in particular theatre. Um, but what book or books have had the, the biggest influence on your life and that you might want to recommend? Well, I unfortunately, I love Charles Dickens. Um, my my family. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. But he's a bit out of date now. But I think his. He was he and Victor Hugo, Les Miserables, were they were the two authors who were really great evangelical authors um, against social social injustice and that sort of thing. And I just think Dickens has some amazing characters. And um, Nicholas Nickleby actually was would be my favourite of those um, of of his books. But they are just magnificent. And Les Miserables, if if you haven't read it is a really don't worry about the go and see the show but the book on which it is based is an amazing piece of social um writing uh, at a time when things were just beginning to change of more modern authors um my favorite book recently is by amor towels who's an american investment was an investment banker and he's written a book called a gentleman in moscow which is I think one of the greatest books I have read of, of you know modern modern sort of genre um, about a, 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 a Russian count who gets stuck in Moscow at the time of the revolution and he he spends his life in a hotel room um, but it's a, just an amazing book beautifully oh, written I'll that I will add that to my list Gentlemen and lastly um, so who inspires you um, and why dead or alive <laughs> well there is a, uh, this is creeping a bit, but there is a man at the moment who's Lord Mayor of London, uh, the 695th Lord Mayor and the first American. Uh, his name is Michael Manelli, Professor Michael Manelli. And I had the pleasure of working with him uh, in the early 2000s. When uh, we needed to revolutionize PEFC, uh, it was it was an old landowner based organization that needed to come into the 21st century. And uh, somebody who we knew recommended Michael Manelli to us because he'd done a lot of work setting up the Marine Stewardship Council with um, uh, um, World War WWF. And he, we, well, I met him and was just amazed. And he taught me so much about how to look at a problem. Um, you know, he said, for example, I said, well, I think we need to move the main off the head office from Luxembourg to Geneva. He said, you can't say that. So why? He said, you can only go to Geneva if it's the right place to go. You have got to sensibly, first of all, why don't you want to be in Luxembourg? And why don't you want to be in New York or London or Paris or Hong Kong or wherever? And his, he's got an amazing mind. And just the way he got me to focus on issues and come to realize how to approach major issues involving a lot of money. Um, and in the end, we did go to Geneva uh, right. from Luxembourg, but we went for the right reasons. You know, do you want money, New York? Do you want to be with the ENGO community, Geneva? Do you want uh, networks with um, consumer organizations, maybe London? Um, but you had to define what it was you wanted. And, and that, I learnt an enormous amount from him. Um, I still see him very occasionally um, and had the absolute privilege of being in when he was a sheriff. Um, the old Bailey is, of course, run by the sheriffs, you know, as in the run by the city of London, not by the Department of Justice. And um, he invited me to go and have lunch with the judges. Um, 
it was only a very brief lunch and it's a fairly uh, sparse lunch and there's no alcohol i hasten to add um but so there's no good having your case in the afternoon and hope the judge may fall asleep or something but it was um so I, i've kept in touch with him but he taught me so much um there's a brilliant mind and he can he's well he's yeah anyway and he also played rugby for harvard against yale and did you know that the rugby fixture between Yale and Harvard is older than the American football fixture. Huh. Is it? Well, uh. rugby predated American football. And of course, the old Ivy Leagues used to play the traditional sort of um, English sports. Every day is a school day. <laughs> but his 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 reason for picking rugby was an interesting one. But it was it shows his, the way his mind works. He said, I did a calculation and I reckon you have the highest alcohol to effort reward. <laughs> fantastic i love it well look mike thank you so much for your time and, it's been a pleasure uh, and thanks again for all your support over the years and uh, i wish you well um i wish your family well thank you and um yeah thanks and also well done for your two sides i think does an amazing job and you and martin and the others it's um it's, it's a worthwhile cause and and articulates the industry's position very well <laughs>